Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Dr. Colleen Berry, the chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, talks with Dr. Beth McGinty, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and lead author of a new study on COVID-19 psychological distress, and loneliness. The study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Also joining the conversation is Dr. Danny Fallon, chair of the Department of Mental Health. They discuss how to lower anxiety and protect our mental health as we move into the summer months of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's listen. Beth McGinty and Danny Fallon, thank you both for joining me today. Beth, let's start with you. You are the lead author of a new study in JAMA on psychological distress, loneliness, and COVID-19. Can you share a little about the study and its findings? Sure, thanks for having me. We did a nationally representative survey of adults in the United States, and we measured their psychological distress using a validated measure called the Kessler-6 in April of 2020, right at the height of the initial phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we found that psychological distress was quite elevated. In April 2020, the proportion of people with serious psychological distress was 13.6% relative to only 3.9% in 2018, which is the most recent year of pre-COVID data available. So that's a 10 percentage point increase in serious psychological distress in early April relative to the period before the coronavirus outbreak. That sounds like a very big increase. Can you put it in context and give us a sense of how much year-to-year fluctuation we've seen in rates of psychological distress prior to COVID? Is this a normal jump that we might expect? No, this is quite a big fluctuation during the COVID pandemic time period. The typical prevalence of serious psychological distress is about 4% among U.S. adults. It's very consistent over time. It's been about 4% for the past decade. So these findings about who experienced the largest increases in psychological distress were perhaps a bit counterintuitive. Given the number of elderly individuals who were social distancing alone, I might have expected that the largest increases in early April would have been among the elderly, for example. But that's not what you found, right? Correct. That's not what we found. I think many of us in public health were particularly worried about the elderly as we started social distancing and were worried about social isolation and loneliness in that group. But what we found was that actually the highest levels and the biggest increase relative to 2018 in psychological distress were actually among young adults, ages 18 to 29. We also saw very large increases among Hispanics and people living in low-income households. In contrast to that, we saw a much smaller increase among that older adult group. They went from about 4% prevalence of serious psychological distress in 20. 2018 to about 7%. And what about rates of loneliness? How have rates of loneliness changed in the era of COVID-19, at least at the time period that you were looking at? Loneliness changed a lot less than psychological distress. I was a bit surprised by this finding, given the emphasis on social distancing and all of the dialogue around loneliness. But what we found was that in April 2020, about 14% of adults felt that they always or often were lonely. And in comparison, a national survey conducted in 2018 found that about 11% of U.S. adults always or often felt lonely. So only a very small increase. 
That's really interesting. So Danny, let's bring you into the conversation. You're the chair of the only Department of Mental Health within a school of public health in the country. First, tell us why mental health is a public health issue. Sure. So even before the pandemic, mental health and behavioral health issues like substance use are problems that are common in our society. And we already know that these problems are associated with many challenges, like limiting our education or employment opportunities, our daily functioning, our relationships, et cetera. And importantly, we also know that mental and physical health issues are deeply intertwined. I often quote things like um, research that shows that people with depression, um, for example, experience four to five times the risk of a heart attack uh, or greater than two times the risk for diabetes. And sadly, women with depression have over three times the risk of breast cancer. I could keep giving you statistics like this to demonstrate how deeply um, related mental and physical health are. We could look at it the other way. Physical illnesses often create experiences of symptoms of mental illness, such as sadness and anxiety. And treating these symptoms, even in the context of physical health, can improve both. And so with that lens, mental health is essential to public health. So Danny, you've read this JAMA study. What are the most important things that struck you about it? Well, I'm always struck by the power of data and the importance of understanding how events affect different people and the importance of measuring uh, this in our population. This can help us guide resources to particular people and uh, particularly in most effective ways. Older adults, as was already discussed, may need different tools than younger people. And in these data, it sounds like that may be true and that older adults may be experiencing the pandemic quite differently in terms of psychological distress than younger people. And as was also pointed out, different economic situations might require different strategies. Um, so I thought this paper highlights uh, things like those with the lowest income are particularly distressed. This is consistent with work from members of our department that have used similar survey panel methods in the U.S. and across the world um, that see psychological distress particularly related to perceived and real financial hardships. Also highlights that vulnerability of particular groups has to be considered. It was also mentioned that folks of Hispanic descent uh, reported psychological stress higher than others. We would think not only about this group, but also those who already have a diagnosed mental health or behavioral health or substance use condition um, may be at greater risk for psychological distress. And we could keep going through whether those with caregiving uh, responsibilities or other subgroups are particularly vulnerable. So what are the most important steps people can take right now to lower anxiety and to protect their mental health in this incredibly difficult moment? Danny, first to you. So I think some of the tips and tools are simple, but important, and you have to be intentional about them. So I would say first, regulate your own news or media intake, uh, listening to the news over and over again, which does have a lot of scary content can be troublesome for many people. So paying attention to how much news or media intake or social media intake um, you're, you're doing every day. Um, the second is stick to a schedule as best you can. We've all been disrupted in our daily routines, and that can lead to uncertainty. And so it's very important to try to find a schedule that works for you in this new environment. Third and pretty obvious, take care of your body. Um, some folks find meditation helpful. Many folks need to pay attention to their exercise, sleep, and uh, eating and drinking during this time. Fourth, be aware of your own thoughts. If you find that you're starting to perseverate or think more often about the negative consequences of this pandemic, pay attention to that and try to give yourself some talk therapy to remind yourself of the balance and the positive things going on as well. And the last one I'll mention is find moments of happiness, find things that you like to do. That seems simple, but can be hard to accomplish. So if you enjoy art or people or music, find ways to integrate that into your day. That can help quite a bit. Laura Murray in our department has done some excellent videos and other kinds of op-ed articles to really highlight some of these tools, both at the individual level, but also at the organizational level. And uh, the Bloomberg School has information like this on its website about these kinds of resources. That was a great list. Beth, do you have any other thoughts? 
I agree. That was a great list. Maybe the only one that I would add is to think about creative ways to stay connected with the people in your lives. There's been a lot of talk about the negative effects of social distancing, but also the reality that what we're really doing is physical distancing and that there are ways through Zoom or by telephone to stay connected. And so doing so is really important. Beth, given the study's findings about the large increases in psychological distress among young adults, are there particular recommendations for this age group or anything you would raise up from the points that Danny mentioned before that are particularly relevant for the young adult group that your study suggests is so very vulnerable right now? So I think all of the suggestions Danny made applied to this age group as well as others. I think really the thing that strikes me about this age group is the need for us as educators who work with college age students and graduate students in this group to be prepared for elevated psychological distress among students and young people writ large. The measure of psychological distress that we used is a validated measure that has been shown to predict clinical mental illness. And so I think we also need to be thinking carefully about how to identify and when appropriate, refer people to clinical treatment. Danny, last question to you. This JAMA study only looked at adults 18 years of age and older, But one might guess that the study's findings of large increases in serious psychological distress among young adults might be mirrored in younger age groups like teens and even younger kids. Do you want to speculate here? Yeah, this is really important. Many studies focused on youth are now including questions regarding mental health um, that can provide us with the current picture of the immediate effects on children and youth. But importantly, we need to think about and monitor the longer term impact on children who are at vulnerable developmental stages and, you know, are experiencing many of the same things we adults are experiencing grief at the loss of some of the opportunities and particularly schools and graduation, uh, anxiety around the uncertainty, sadness. Um, All of these, you know, in a context of very disrupted routines, which we know are important, as I said, not only to adults, but particularly to children and youth. Um, So it'll be important to understand and mitigate those negative consequences, both in the immediate, but particularly in the long term. I do want to say, though, on the bright side, anecdotally, I've heard many reports of children, positive experiences during this time, reconnecting with family, spending more time idle, which can often generate creativity, spending more time outside doing things like biking and walking when there's not scheduled clubs or sports events and things like that. They have had to be more creative about how they spend time. And so that may be a positive outcome. And that's another area where we should do rigorous research to understand the benefits. On that potential silver lining and with the reminder of the need for research on the effects of COVID-19. I'm going to end. And thank you, Beth and Danny, so much for joining me today. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.